Okay, hello everyone. Um, I hope you're all still on. Sorry for the delay. Um, I was having problems with the microphone, so there's always something when I'm on Beck and Facebook. Um, okay, hello everyone. I hope people haven't uh, all liked it because they thought I wasn't coming on. Sorry for the delay. Um, I was having problems with my microphone, so it's fixed now. Every time I try and do one of these talks, there's been some feckin' issue with something or other. But um, I'm just going to wait until I have a couple of viewers and then I will get started. Um, yeah, so I have a lot to get through today, so I'm going to talk kind of fast. Um, but hopefully it won't be too fast with my um, thick Irish accent. Hopefully you'll be able to understand me. Um, can everybody hear me okay to begin with? Because the microphone wasn't working in the beginning. So um, if you can just let me know if you can hear me okay. There's about a minute delay, so I'll just have to wait a couple of seconds for <clears throat> somebody to let me know. Um, I was having problems. So can you all see me and hear me okay? I'll be putting up my slideshow now in a second as well, so um, it's just a little bit easier and it's a bit more interesting rather than people just looking at my boring old face talking. So I'm going to share this anyway. Hopefully get started. Okay, Kim, thank you. Um, so can you see the screen now? I have a PowerPoint presentation thing me jig up. Um hear me and see yay, alas. Um no problem. Like I said, every time I've tried to do one of these talks, I've had some sort of a problem with um camera, microphone, something or other. So yay. Hi Tracy. Um hi Margaret. Hi Kim. Okay, so yes, like I said, I, I have a lot to get through and this is just kind of like a basic introduction to all this because there's just so feckin' much that I could talk about. I started off um, not so sunny Scotland. Yes, it's not so sunny here in Ireland either. Um, I had about 70 PowerPoint pages, uh, slides that I could have done and I had to kind of compress it because I could have talked for hours about it. Um, about me, so yeah, my name's Louise and I run um, Positive Fitness. I've been in the canny sports uh, for about 10 years now. I started off in 2011 um, and I just got hooked from day one. I got a husky and kind of got into the sports because I wanted to to do something that the, the breed was bred for. So that's how I got into it. Um, canny sports are my passion. Um, I love canny cross, but my favourites are definitely bike and scooter. Um, but just in terms of kind of feeding and hydration and all that, you know, it's so important. You see so many dogs that are um, they're out running and they're struggling because they haven't been properly hydrated and all that. So I just thought it might be something that people might be interested in. And the talk today as well, it's not even necessarily specific to canny sports. It's kind of, you know, applicable to all um, all dogs, really. You know what I mean? If they're, um, you know, they're doing fly ball or they're doing agility or whatever. Mace, hey. Sorry, I have a, a puppy there that um, I thought she would have been rested. She was out for a run this morning, but she's a bit hyper. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to cover today, um, I'm just going to talk about what kind of constitutes a, a canine athlete. So we're, we're kind of looking at it from an athlete point of view. And um, we're going to look at exercise categories and how, depending on the exercise category your dog is in, um, depending on the sport that they're doing, you know, why we would feed certain types of feed. Um, nutrients, so we're going to look at your usual kind of carbs, fat, protein. And the best time to, time to feed before runs and after runs and the same about hydration and I'll just talk a little bit about dehydration as well if I have time at the end. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit quickly because, um, <clears throat> yes, there is a lot to cover. And uh, like I said, I kind of had to make it a, a basic talk because it's just so feckin' much that I could talk about. So what constitutes, a what constitutes a canine athlete? So you're looking at, you know, your dogs that are out working, um, you know, regardless, you know, you, you, working is kind of a broad term. You can look at hunting, herding, sled dogs. You can look at, um, you know, if you're out just jogging with your dog and all, you know, technically your dog's a canine athlete. If you were doing kind of three, maybe four days, you know, work a week with your dog, then you can class them as an athlete, regardless of how fast you, you're running or how fast your dog is working or whatever, you know, you could still class them as working dogs. Um, so, you know, you bring in your dog for a walk, slow walk five days a week and bringing them for a run on the beach doesn't make them an athlete as such. But, you know, even so, the feeding and hydration thing can kind of come across the board anyway. <clears throat> so, you know, it's the same. Sorry, I'm going to be clearing my throat a bit. My asthma's playing up. And when I talk, it just gets kind of crap. Um, so overestimating, you know, like like with yourselves, you know, what goes in must come out. And if you're putting in more than what's coming out, you're going to end up with an overweight dog. So the average pet dog consumes about a thousand calories a day. 
Um, working dogs, depending on how much they're working, they can be between one and a half to two and a half times this. Um, in extreme temperatures like snow and stuff like that, if you're looking at sled dogs, that could be, you know, up to another 50%. Um, so, you know, if you, the examples then, if you look at sled dogs pulling drafts, so they're kind of going slow, but they're going at a distance for 10 miles a day, they need between 4,000 and 8,000 calories because obviously they're, go they're going to be in the cold, so they're going to be burning off that little bit more too. Um, if I'm speaking too fast as well, let me know because I am aware that I have a big thick Irish accent. So if you can't understand me, let me know. Um, if you look at the sprint dogs, so the, the sled dogs that are running that little bit faster and doing up to 70 miles a day, they need about 10,600 calories. So you have to take in, into consideration how much, you know, how you can actually get all that food in because, you know, 10,000 calories is a lot of food. So you obviously can't just give them 10,000 calories worth of food. So you need to kind of look at how you're, you know, how you're feeding and what you're feeding. Um, so the exercise categories are, are generally classed as three different types of categories. So you have your sprint first, first, which will be kind of greyhound. So you're looking at that fast burst of running and, you know, it lasts maybe about two minutes less. Um, you know, they're doing like a kilometre around a track. That's your sprint. Then you have your intermediate, which is generally most of the kind of mush and sports like canny cross, um, bike jar and scooter, and they would come under that. So the exercise would last longer than two minutes, but less than, you know, in around four hours. So even your longer runs, like maybe marathon distance with your dog and stuff like that, that would come under that. Then endurance, you have your, your extreme over four hours. So you're looking at, you know, maybe even ultra marathons. I know some of them are <clears throat> quite long. You know, if you're looking at more than four hours where your dog is actually on the go the whole time, and um, they will be classed as endurance category. Um, you know, you're looking at your kind of idea rod and your, your proper sled dog races over in Alaska where they're doing maybe 70 miles a day. So <clears throat> a lot of the the research that was done on nutrition and stuff like that was based on sled dogs because like i said obviously you know these dogs are working they're working really hard and they need the calories they need the best of diet so that they can actually do it because it's not just 70 miles for one day it could be 70 miles over you know over 10 11 12 days so you need to make sure that your dogs are are able to run they're getting the proper food you know they don't have diarrhea and stuff like that so a lot of the studies were done on sled dogs so if you consider what sled dog mushers would be feeding their dogs, they'd be feeding a lot of high fat food. So you'd be looking at salmon, seal, moose, um, caribou and stuff like that, you know, and they're all quite fatty foods. They're high in fat and they're high in protein, so they wouldn't have a lot of cereal in them. Um, so one of the studies, they tried kind of feeding a commercial cereal based food, um, you know, which was fine. And it was, you know, commercial dog food. So it had all the, you know, the requirements and stuff like that. But they found that a lot of the dogs developed diarrhea. Now, I know that a lot of working dogs will have diarrhea anyway because it's down to adrenaline and stress. But this was more so than normal. Um, in the 1970s, there was a study done. Um, originally, back in the 70s, hi, Emery, um, they thought that, you know, with humans, they were looking at a lot of carb loading before they went for runs and stuff like that. So they kind of assumed that the dogs were the same. So that was kind of proven to be wrong. Um, so what they did was they kind of really cut down the carbs and they upped the fat and the protein and they found that the dogs, you know, their blood levels, the, the amount of oxygen in their blood was quite high and it was good, it was really good, but the dogs were developing diarrhea. So they came to the conclusion that a little bit of carbs is good, so the likes of fiber and stuff like that can be good and it can prevent this diarrhea, but you don't want to go the extreme and give them a lot of carbs. Like I said, this is a lot of overload and I can, I can post links to the studies if people want at the end as well. Um, so your main nutrients, anyway, um, you're looking at your carbohydrates, fats, protein, vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and water. A lot of people kind of forget about water and they tend to just focus on food, but water is so important. And I'll get to that in a few minutes too. Um, so carbohydrates, um, carbs from food, it's broken down and converted into glucose, which is a type of sugar. And it's good in the beginning. You know, it kind of gives you that energy boost. So, um, you know, that's great. That's what you need if you're running. So you know, you're, you're full of energy, your body's going, it's great, you're able to go, but then you get what's, what we know as a sugar crash. So after about kind of 45 minutes, your body just crashes. Um, your body works to reduce the glucose levels, so the pancreas will release insulin, which will then draw the glucose into the body, resulting in this crash. So if you're running for longer than 45 minutes and you've, you've carb loaded beforehand, you're just going to crash and you're not going to be able, and it's the same with dogs. So that's why... High carb diets generally aren't recommended 
um, as the main source of energy for the longer activity. So if you're looking at intermediate or endurance and stuff like that, high carbs um, just don't work. If you're looking at your sprint, so your two minutes and you just need that quick sugar boost, yeah, it can work like that. And, you know, um, there is a theory that a lot of greyhounds, their metabolism can actually deal quite well with higher carb diets because that's what they're bred for. They're bred for that kind of fast, you know, two minute sprint, five minute sprint, maybe or whatever. Um, so some people with greyhounds actually find that their dogs do better when they have carbs in their diet. If fat or protein are used as the main energy source, then you don't get that sugar crush. Um, so, you know, in saying that carbs aren't bad, you need carbs. They provide four, um, four calories per gram. And like I said, they're good for sprinters. And as I mentioned there earlier, it can also be good uh, for stress diarrhea because around events and races and stuff like that, you'll often find a lot of dogs tend to get diarrhea and it's it's just that whole adrenaline thing. So a little bit of fiber in the diet can actually be good and it'll kind of bulk up their, their stools. So ideally you want to be looking at about 15% max um, carbs in their diet. Now I'm not going to go into the whole raw versus kibble versus this or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, that's not what this is about. That's a talk that could take up another four hours and I'm not going to do that. So I'm just kind of telling you what the ideal things are and what to look out for. So fat is generally the best source of energy for dogs. Um, you know, a dog's metabolism is different to ours, so they can they can work the you know they can work on fat a lot better. They can burn it off better than we can, and their bodies are made to deal with that. And like I said, if you go back to the sled dogs, a lot of the the food that they would have been fed were high fat diets. You know, you have your fatty meats like you know moose or whale or caribou or whatever. You know what I mean? And even kind of fatty fish like salmon and all that's what they'd be fed. And um, you're getting little over double what you'd get um calorie wise from carbs so you're getting nine calories per gram so proper working sled dogs will often get more than 50 percent fat in their diet um so that's kind of the the recommendations for dogs that are working endurance and intermediate um so a study in the 1980s sorry i have to cough <coughs> all this talking um, a study in the 1980s by um downy evaluated high fat and high carb diets in working dogs so that um you can see the details on the screen there. So the dogs were exercised on treadmill and they, they looked at the amount of oxygen um, in their blood and stuff like that. Um, so what they found was that the diet, the high fat diet had a higher volume of oxygen than the high carb diet. And um, even untrained dogs, so dogs that weren't conditioned and they weren't used to training, they still worked better on the high fat diet and they could use the fat as fuel a lot better than humans could. And they could exercise for that bit longer. Um, now, if you look at the third point there, even the muscles changed. So they had an increase in um, mitochondria, which, you know, is energy burning um, particles. So that increased by up to 30 percent. So it kind of links in with the study that, you know, high fat diets are a lot better than high carb diets. Um, I have a copy of that study, too. So if people want, I can put the link up to the study. It's um, it's a free download, so you don't have to pay. Um, I can put that study up as well, but it just kind of shows, you know, that the studies were done. And like I said, most of the studies on nutrition and working dogs was done on sled dogs just, you know, because it was um, they were the kind of top canine athletes. So protein, we're not forgetting about that. Um, high quality animal protein is really what's needed for dogs. Um, like I said, I'm not getting into kind of kibble and raw and blah, 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 blah. Um, but high quality animal protein is what you need to be looking for in your food. Um, they provide amino acids, so they help to, to recover, you know, they repair the muscle tissue because every time you exercise, you know, there is damage to the muscle tissue. So obviously you need to be able to repair that. So the amino acids will, um, will help with that. Um, they also help to prevent sports anemia, which um, can happen as well. So you have a lower level of red blood cells, which um, is not good for the dogs either. So another study done um, where the dogs were fed 28% protein, their lower, their red blood cell count was lower than those who were fed 32%. So ideally you want to be looking for about 30 to 40% of their calories being from protein. Um, higher levels of protein than carbohydrates can help to lower susceptible, susceptibility sorry, to injuries. Um, you're getting about the same amount of calories as you would with carbohydrate, but um, just it's a better source of energy than carbohydrate. Um, ideally, you want to be looking for animal sources and high quality animal sources for your protein. So in terms of feeding around training and um, events and stuff like that, Alex, yeah, I'll put up the, the two, um, the 1970s and the 1980s study um, at the end. So a lot of how you feed them depends on the activity type. So 
you're looking at your sprint activities, you know, regardless of the activity, you don't want to be really feeding within kind of four hours before you run or before you exercise. When I say run, I'm kind of covering everything. So it could be agility, could be fly ball. I'm just going to say run rather than kind of breaking it down. Um, you don't want to feed within the four hours that you're going to be running them. Um, because, you know, you're running a risk of blow and you're run, you're, you know, you have a higher risk of, I mean, if you've ever eaten before you've gone for a run, it's not comfortable. It weighs you down and it's, um, you know, you'll end up with diarrhea and everything else. So what you can do if your dog is going for a sprint and it's going for that two minute kind of run, you can give a small amount of carbs within 30 minutes. Um, you know, ideally kind of maybe 45 to 30 minutes before they run. And that way you're going to get that boost, like I was saying earlier, where the, the glycogen is, is raised and it'll give you that boost of energy. Um, you know, then the sugar crash, you should be finished running by the time you get that. So the intermediate, you're looking at, you know, no more than four hours before you run and endurance the same. Um, but with endurance, obviously, because they're running for such a long amount of time, you want to be given a little snack as well. So you're looking for a protein and a fat based snack. Um, you know, there's a lot of different kind of snacks out on the market and there are a lot that are marketed towards dogs. Um, and if people want, I can kind of put up links to, to different ones that I know of. Um, sprint and intermediate, you shouldn't really need to be feeding your dog during these activities, especially what well, sprint obviously doesn't last long enough. But intermediate, you know, if, if you pre-feed your dog well enough beforehand, they should be able to run for that amount of time without snacks in theory. And if you're using fat and protein as your main energy sources, you know, you can fast your dog the morning of a run and he should still be able to metabolize the energy that's already in his body. Um, so feeding after activities. Um, ideally, you want to wait until the body is back to what's called baseline. So if your dog comes back from a run and they're panting and they're, you know, their heart rate is up and everything else, you can feed them, but you run a higher risk of bloat as well. Again, especially, you know, deep chested breeds, but all breeds of dog are very susceptible to bloat if you feed them right after a run. And a lot of it comes down to nervous system. So without going into too much detail and getting all technical, you have your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous systems. Your sympathetic nervous system is triggered. It's that kind of fight or flight. It's triggered by adrenaline. So that's going to focus more on kind of fight and flight. So if you're feeding while that's you know while that's at play your dog's not going to actually be able to absorb a lot of the um a lot of the nutrients from the food anyway so you're basically just kind of wasting that and chances are they're just going to get diarrhea and it's going to run out of them anyway so you want to wait until your dog is relaxed it's back the parasympathetic nervous system is kind of back in play which is your rest and digest um nervous system so that means that the dog can actually digest and they can absorb all the nutrients um after a run, like I said, when I'm talking run, I'm talking about all different kind of activities. Um, ideally, you want to cool your dog down before, you know, you look at anything. So give them a little walk, wait until the heart rate comes back down gradually. You know, if you're racing, obviously, sometimes, you know, you come back from a race and you haven't a hope of actually having any energy to walk your dog. So that's why it's kind of handy to have maybe a helper that can just walk your dog around, you know, let them go to the toilet, let them sniff, let them relax. You can give them a small treat then maybe. But, um, you know, you want to be waiting a little while until they're, they're more settled um, before you feed them. And most people will kind of recommend about one and a half to two hours after a run before you feed them. I have seen people who say, no, I feed my dogs half an hour after and they never get bloat and they're never sick and blah, 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 blah. It's down to individual dogs, but these are the general guidelines. So what food is best? Like I said, I'm not getting into, you know, raw versus fresh versus kibble and all that because that's just a whole whole other minefield that I'm not I'm not getting into today yeah, I raw feed mine and that's just personal choice but you need to consider the type of food that you're feeding so if you're feeding really cheap kind of crap uh, for lack of a better word um your dog's just not it's going to be made up of stuff that your dog can't really digest you know dogs digest best from kind of animal sources in general um so you want to be looking for high quality food that's easily digested um, if you look at the ingredients on, on a bag of food, you know, um, especially, you know, kibble, they'll have a full kind of analytical constituency or whatever. Um, it's like human food. If you look at the first ingredient, it's generally what there is the most of in the bag. Um, so, you know, if the first if the first ingredient is something like cereal, it's just made for filler. So it's actually not that good. You want to be looking for some sort of high quality animal source of meat. 
um, as the first ingredient, ideally, if you can. Um, I'm going to show you just two quick dog food labels um, and just kind of show you the difference between, you know, good quality food and a, a cheap one. Um, you might recognize the cheap one just by the color of the bag, but I'm not naming names. Um, also be aware that just because it is working dog food and there are a few of them out on the market now because obviously there's um, money to be made in it and a lot of companies have jumped on that. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's good either. Um, you'll pay, what, 70 quid, maybe more for a 15 kilo bag. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's good and it's right because um, I'll show you one now in a few minutes. And like I said, I'm not naming names. But um, if you have a look at the, the ingredients, you'll see why it's not really necessarily that good. So these are two different labels. Um, the one on the right is a, a well-known brand of dog food that... Um, is crap <laughs> for lack of a better description if you look at the the first ingredient you're getting a lot of corn so that's going to be what the most you know bulk of that food is going to be made up of corn um then you look at the second ingredient and it's meat and bone meal so it doesn't even specify what meat it is which is kind of a bit worrying but then if you look at the third ingredient it's corn gluten meal so that's actually another corn product and um, so what they've done is they've broken down that corn twice so that they can, you know, list it in two different places rather than putting it all, you know, saying that there's, you know, probably 50 to whatever percent corn in it. Um, you know, and if you look at all the ingredients, that's a long list of ingredients and half of them you can't even pronounce and half of them you probably don't even know what they are, unless you're a scientist. Um, I don't know what a lot of them are, but that's a lot. Now, if you go to the one on the left, it's a it's a raw dog food um, and, you know, shorter list of ingredients, but you know it's broken down and you know you're getting tripe you're getting lamb heart you know you know what the meat is it's not just you know byproducts or whatever um you know so if you're looking at what do you think the dog can digest better obviously the one on the left is better like i said it's raw and i'm not kind of you know going into raw and all that but um you know just look at the ingredients and if you're buying a dog food and you, the first ingredient says you know beef fair enough you know it's beef and it's the first ingredient so it's you know it's, it's a high quality one the next one is a working dog food. Um, meat content, 25% stands out on me first anyway, which you kind of go, right, well, the rest of it's all going to be, you know, plant-based, which, you know, dogs don't digest them generally. Um, you know, so the first ingredient is maize, which is, you know, generally genetically modified and everything else. So the bulk of that food is made up of maize. Not great. Um, then you have dehydrated beef meat. So if you're feeding that as a working dog food, which is what it's marketed as, you know, you're feeding a lot of carbohydrates to your dog. If you feed that before your dog runs, chances are they're going to get a sugar crash. And it's not a greyhound working food, which you would kind of say maybe, OK, you know, that's the reason. And it's just marketed as a general working dog food. Um, you know, so like I said, that's just kind of a quick, quick kind of intro to it, because uh, I could I could talk all day just on dog food alone. Um, but there you go. So hydration. Um, hydration. When you look at hydration, you look at loss of water and how to kind of prevent it and the best ways of, of keeping your dog hydrated. Um, obviously, dogs don't sweat the way we do. They do lose a little bit through the, the pads of their paws, but generally most of their, you know, their loss of um, bodily fluids will come through panting. Um, active dogs are very vulnerable to dehydration because obviously they're going to be panting that bit more as they're, they're running and they're working. Um, the three main ways that water is lost lost from a dog's body is from urination defecating and panting so if you look at the next slide you'll actually kind of see um this was reynolds et al and um, they did a study again i can i can post up the link to that one as well and they looked at how the dogs lost um water from their bodies so if you look at the house dog in general you know it's kind of a lot from urine a little bit from feces and a bit from respiration because they're not panting all the time you look at the sprint dog then and those levels kind of go a little bit higher um, and if you look at a distance dog, you know, more than half of their, the water lost from their body is from respiration. So that's from panting, you know, so that's, that's how it, it, it's so important to actually make sure that your dog is hydrated. Now, obviously if your dog has diarrhea before a run, they're going to lose that little bit more water as well, just because, you know, the, the, the feces is so watery and stuff like that, but it's just kind of an interesting little chart to have a look at and actually see how they do lose um, most of the water from their body. Um, so if you look at our bodies in general, and dogs are the same, 70% of the cells in your body are made up of water. 
Water is so important to play the role in, you know, so many bodily functions, including the regulation of the temperature of the body. Um, so in humans, 2% loss of water from the body can affect your mental and your physical performance. So if, you, um, if you're a runner and you've ever gone for a run and you haven't properly hydrated, I'm terrible for doing it, um, you know, it can affect your performance and you'll struggle more. Whereas if you're really well hydrated beforehand, generally, in theory, um, your performance will be a little bit better. You know, your brain will be off if you're dehydrated and it's the same for dogs. So if you're running a dog, especially if you're racing and stuff like that, and you're running a dog that's dehydrated, he can't really focus properly. It's just not able and it's not down to the dog. It's down to the fact that they're just not hydrated and, you know, their performance is affected from that. 15% loss of water from the body can actually result in death. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a, when you look at it, 15% is not a huge amount, um, considering how serious it is. Um, I know when we think of kind of dehydration and stuff like that, you tend to think of hot weather and it can, but also extreme cold. So if you look at, you know, where it's really, really cold and really dry, extreme temperatures can also result in a lot of, um, a lot of loss of water from the body as well. And, you know, obviously living in Ireland, and I know quite a few people are from the UK, air humidity is killer. You know, you could have a, a cold day where it's raining outside, but the humidity is high. And like I said earlier, I've asked Matt, and if the humidity is high, I struggle to run. You know, so humidity will also play a big factor. And like I said, if you're in Ireland and um, the UK, especially the humidity is a killer, you know, and even on a cool day, your dog might struggle. So, you know, making sure that your dog is well hydrated before a run is, is essential. So, obviously, you know, with us, we can say, right, well, we're going for a run later on today. So we're going to drink, you know, three litres of water or whatever. You can't say that to a dog because the dog will just be like, what? Um, so you have to get inventive and think of ways to make him drink. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm um, drunk. So what, what most people will do is use what's called baited water. So... What you want to be doing is mixing something with the water to make them to encourage them to drink. Um, the most common source of kind of baited water would be tinned sardines and tinned mackerel. Um, most people recommend oil because that oil will kind of be a little bit of extra energy source for them as well. Um, now I'm not talking about throwing a whole tin of sardines into five liters of water. That's too much. Approximately maybe around 100 mils for every 10 kilo of body weight with a half tin. So if you have a dog that's about 20 kilos, look at maybe 200 mils of water with uh, one full um, sardine or mackerel. Mix it up, make it kind of soupy because if you just throw the fish in, they're just going to pick the fish out and they won't drink the water. So you want to mix it up and make sure that it's kind of nice and soupy. Because if you, again, going back to sled dogs, if you look at while they're running these long distance races, they come home, they come back from the run. Most of the time they'll be getting like a broth, so it's a soup. So they're getting all that water in with all this fatty food as well. So it's the same kind of concept. You give about two hours before a run so that it gives time for the dog to absorb. And if you've ever run with a belly full of water, the noise of it alone is uh, <laughs> it's fairly off-putting, but it's not comfortable. And it can also contribute to risk of bloat as well. You can give a little bit, about half an hour maybe before the run as well, but you don't want to be giving large amounts of water because it's going to make them want to pee while they're running as well. So if you give them a little bit of water, you know, like I said, around your 100 mils for every 10 kilo and, you know, give about two hours in between, bring them to the toilet and all before they go, chance there, they're going to pee and they're going to, you know, have all that out of their system as well before they run. So it means that they've absorbed the water, the body is well hydrated and they should they should run better in theory. Um, and it's always ideal to kind of get into a, a routine where you prehydrate and your dog will also learn then, OK, well, I'm getting my baited water today. It means I'm going for a run later as well. So it's all down to routine. <clears throat> There's other options as well. I have one dog who isn't that bothered if I give him sardines and water. He kind of goes, no, I'm not really that pushed because it's still water. Um, you can use goat's milk diluted in water. So about kind of half goat's milk, half water. I've heard of raw feeders putting blood in water. Sounds disgusting, but, um, you know, whatever makes your dog drink and every dog is different. Um, bone broth is another one as well. Um, bone broth is also full of kind of nutrients and it's, um, it's good for electrolytes as well. So that's actually quite good before a run. So you're looking again, kind of 50-50 bone, um, uh, bone broth and water ratio. What some people do is they'll freeze bone broth and they'll just kind of throw the, the ice cubes down into the water and let the dog drink that. Um, what I do sometimes if I'm running the dogs and I feel they might need a little bit of energy, um, I'm doing a half marathon next week with them, so I'll give them a raw egg and then in that mixture of goat's milk and water, just for a little bit of kind of extra 
energy as well but you know it's down to personal preference and some people wouldn't give anything but i just kind of feel like if they're going to be running for excuse me two hours it's you know they kind of need something that's again down to preference um find out what works for your dog like i said i've seen raw feeders give blood and water and people go oh jesus you know but um if their dogs are drinking then so be it um there's also different kind of hydration drinks on the market this is one that i use with my dogs um it's vet formulated so it's um you know a lot of research was put into it and it has your electrolytes and stuff as well um it's chicken flavor so it kind of has that chicken soup um taste as well what i have heard some people who um give their dogs this i've, ha I've heard some people say that when they give this before a run or a race the dogs tend to be less foamy when they cross the finish line um you know and obviously like the foam will be a, a sign of dehydration so if they're coming across the finish line and they're not foamy um you know it obviously means that the hydration has worked for them um, you know, there are other, you know, powders that you can put into water and all as well. And it kind of depends on what's available to your country and what your dog will drink. Most of my dogs won't drink a lot of the powders, regardless of what flavor they are. But most of them will drink that oral aid. And that's good for after a run too. So if you forget to hydrate um, two hours before, you can still kind of hydrate up to about maybe half an hour before the run. You just give less water or less baited water. Um, you know, because obviously you don't want them running with no water in their system at all. But at the same time, you don't want to overload the system either. So, you know, if you're looking at maybe an hour before a run, just give them maybe half the amount that you would if you were going for the two hours. The other thing to note is that, you know, yeah, prehydration is really important, but it's something that you should be doing all the time anyway. So if you're running your dogs maybe four days a week, I would look at hydrating them every day anyway. Um, and what most people do is just give them water in their dinner. So regardless of whether it's kibble, you know, if you put water in kibble, let it soak it up and let your dog, um, let your dog have it that way, you know, kind of tricks them because they don't realize they're getting water. Um, if you raw feed and you have maybe kind of like a mincy type raw feed that you're giving them, just mix some water in with that. It doesn't have to be a lot, you know, you're looking at maybe 100 mils or whatever. But if you're doing that every day, long term, it's going to build up in the dog's body. And, you know, long term, they're going to be a lot more hydrated. So during your runs, um, there's kind of two different fields of theories on this. Um, if you're going for a longer run and you think, you know, that your dog might need water, look for routes that are along rivers and stuff like that. So that way your dog can stop. Some people will say, no, I don't do this because it can encourage the dog. Then if you're racing and there's water nearby, it can encourage the dog to actively go looking for water. Um, what I kind of find that once it comes into slightly warmer weather, I will always run the dogs near so they can get in for a dip. Sometimes they don't even want to drink the water. They just want to, you know, get in and have a dip and cool their bellies. And that's fine too. But like I said, some people kind of go, no, nope, no, nope, because if we're racing and there's water, the dog will go over and <clears throat> perfectly valid point. Um, if you think that, you know, you might need, your dog might need a drink while you're out for a run. So if you're out for maybe two or three hours, bring water with you. If you have a hydration backpack, just bring a little collapsible bowl with you. And that way you can, you can pour it in. Some people have taught their dogs to, actually drink from the, the backpack. I've seen people, <clears throat> sorry, I've seen people squirting, you know, they teach the dogs to like, they squirt the water in and it's down to your dog as well. Um, but you know, there's options like that as well. And you can get certain running belts that you can kind of carry bottles of water for you and the dog, you know, and it, it's down to kind of, you know, whatever is comfortable for you. Always try to avoid allowing your dog to drink from puddles because you just don't know what's in the puddles. You know, even in a forest, you're looking at maybe machinery was going through. So there could be oil or there could be antifreeze or anything like that in the puddle as well. And it's just going to make your dog sick. So ideally, you want to kind of discourage them from drinking puddle water. Um, a well hydrated dog will find it easier to cool down. Um, and, you know, if you get up and you're planning on going for a run, maybe about 11 or 12, and you kind of go, I don't know if it's a bit too warm to run or not. Don't run. It's not worth it. You know, your dog won't die if he doesn't go for a run, but he might die if he does. Um, you know, or if you're looking at the forecast and you were planning on going for a run at 11 and the temperatures to get a little bit high, get up earlier, you know, and, and go for a run. That way, if you really, really feel you need to run. But if you're in doubt, don't run at all because it's not worth it. So after runs, um, as with food, you kind of want to wait until your dog has returned to a baseline before you start giving them large amounts of water. Um, for the same reasons, you know, they're not really going to be able to absorb the water properly if their sympathetic nervous system is still going and the adrenaline is still going. Um, have fresh, clean water available. 
what I've seen some people do, especially when the dogs come back and they're really, really foamy. They have two bowls of water, so they have one where the dog is just kind of slopping around and, you know, kind of cleaning their face. And then they have the clean water where they can actually, they can actually drink proper clean water. Um, you know, you have a risk of bloat then if you're bringing your dog straight back from a run and they're collapsing into this big bowl of water and they're slopping and everything else. Um, because they're just taking it, they're taking in air, they're taking in water. So the risk of blow is that little bit higher as well after a run if you feed them straight away. So bring them for a little walk or get somebody to walk them for you. You know, give it maybe 10 minutes or so. And, you know, as long as they start kind of coming back down, the heart rate is down a little bit. The adrenaline is, is less then you know, you can look into hydrating them then. Um, someone just asked about what about the dog stopping to drink in puddles on, on a run. Sometimes it can be learned behavior. Um, you know, if you've been doing that from day one and you've been letting your dog stop to drink in puddles, um, it becomes kind of a habit. But if your dog is well hydrated, chances are he's not going to want to drink from puddles. Um, you know, the, the thing with dogs is that they, they generally only drink water when they need to. So when they feel that the body needs water, they'll generally only drink then, which is why you can't just give them a bottle of water and tell them to drink. So if your dog is drinking from puddles and um, they're doing it all the time on runs, a lot of the chances are that it's um, it's just not hydrated properly. If he's hydrated properly, he shouldn't need to be stopping in puddles. Um, but like I said, it could be a learned behavior as well. And it's just something that you need to try and discourage as much as you can. So if he's stopping on puddles, just try and keep getting him to move um, and kind of try and work out something with him. Um, or, you know, like I said, if you feel that he, he does need a drink of water, try and encourage him to, uh, to drink from a stream or a lake or whatever instead, because you just don't know what's in puddles. And if you look at some puddles, they have that lovely rainbow design, which is usually oil. So if your dog is drinking that, it's just going to make him sick or give him diarrhea or whatever as well. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, so dehydration. I mean, dehydration, like I said, if you lose 15% of your, um, the water from your body, you could die. Um, two, you know, only 2% water loss from the body can affect all your performance and all that. You know, and dehydration is a real risk. And especially in countries like here, you know, when I say here, I'm talking about Ireland and even the UK, where, you know, dogs don't always have time to adjust to a change in temperatures because we tend to go from kind of one extreme to the other. So if you're looking at it getting warmer, like at the moment, you know, it was snowing last week and it's it's quite warm this week, even running the dogs. Um, you know, running the dogs yesterday, it was quite warm. I was out at half eight, nine in the morning and I was kind of going, Jesus, it's getting warm. So a lot of the time the dogs don't actually have time to adjust. Whereas if you look at certain countries where it's that bit warmer, the dogs have time to adjust to that temperature change. And you'll often find that in countries, you know, say Australia and stuff like that. They can actually run the dogs in, in hotter weather than they could here because the dog's bodies have acclimatized to that. So um, that's something else that you also need to take into consideration. You know, and there's so many other factors. You have humidity, like I said here, humidity can play a big role in, um, <clears throat> in dehydration. You have to breed a dog. So if you look at a dog like Siberian Husky, Malamutes, the longer haired dogs that are, you know, originally bred to run in cold weather, a lot of them will struggle that bit more and, you know, I, I've heard a lot of husky people kind of saying anything over eight or ten degrees. I don't, I don't run the dogs because they just can't cope. Um, age a dog. The younger and the older a dog is, they kind of find it harder to regulate their body temperature. So you know, if your dog's that bit older, maybe kind of ten or so, they might struggle a little bit more as well. You know, and, and it's all dog dependent as well. Uh, the weight of the dog. So obviously, an overweight dog is going to struggle a lot more in the heat. The health of the dog. So if you have a, a fit conditioned dog. You know that's running all the time they're going to be a little bit healthier you know if they're well hydrated they're going to be able to to manage a little bit more in the warmer weather than a dog that you know you just got from rescue last week and you decided to bring them out a 10 mile run this week in the in the humid warm weather that we have here it also depends on the individual dog um at the moment i've kind of two dogs that i run um i have dyson and i have lady so lady is a pointer cross and when she runs it's you know, I'm I'm on the go. I'm go 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 go. She doesn't do easy, um. So, you know, she would struggle a little bit more in the hot temperatures. Dyson's a Northern Inuit, so kind of huskyish looking, long haired breed. You know, so he generally wouldn't like the warmer weather. But I could actually run him in warmer weather than I could with Lady because when he runs, he paces himself, so he's not kind of flat out on the go. Um, he did a ten k run there 
in May, not last year because of COVID, but the year before. I've always done it with Dyson anyway. And you know, sometimes you find kind of getting near the end, it is quite warm. Dyson's usually fine. I did it with Lady once and she was just so hot. You know, I kind of said, I don't think it's actually worth running her in this anymore. You know, and like I said, looking at Dyson's build, you know, he's long haired, he has husky in him. He should have been struggling more than Lady was, who, you know, was really thin for her and she's she's lean and she's, you know, she's sleek looking, but it was actually the other way around and she struggled that bit more than he did. So, you know, it is down to individual dog as well. Um, how warm is too warm? Like I said, it kind of depends on the dog and some dogs, um, some dogs tolerate the, the warmer weather better than others. There was always, there was always a kind of a, a thing within the sled dog community where <clears throat> you took humidity and you took the temperature. So the percentage humidity and the temperature in degrees Celsius and you multiply them. So if that comes to more than a thousand, then it's too warm. But, you know, that's not something that you want to kind of use as religion. And if, you know, if you have a husky and you're looking at, oh, well, it's only 999, so it's fine. I can run them. You know, chances are your dog's just going to collapse anyway because it's going to be too warm. So it is kind of a guideline, but it's not it's not set in stone and it is dog dependent as well. So, um, you know, if in doubt, don't run your dog. It's not worth the risk. You know, I've seen people here and they've, you know, they're out and they're running their dog and they're, you know, you're looking at maybe 20 degree heat. You know, I, I, will, I won't run in that, <laughs> you know, I don't have for, um, you know, you'll see somebody and they're out running and they're in like a vest and shorts and they're sweating and they're running their dog on a hot pavement, you know, and you're kind of going, well, your dog has a fur coat on. You're running in a vest because you're too warm. Otherwise, you know, it just doesn't make sense, but people won't listen. Um, you know, and I've kind of been sitting in the van looking at people and I'm like, no, 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 what are you doing? Um, but you know, it's down to your own dog. And if you're in doubt, don't run. Um, some of the signs of dehydration, um, some of the early signs can often be um, tiredness. Your dog is less animated. If you are running them, you might find that they're kind of not really, you know, raring to go the way they normally would. Excessive panting, obviously, um, changes in behavior. So you might find that they're kind of getting a little bit more distracted than they normally would when they're running. Some of those can be signs of um, early dehydration. So if you find that in your dog, you're better off stopping or, you know, getting them water and, and letting them kind of relax again before before you continue. Um, as it goes on and it's kind of, you know, more major signs of dehydration, you have that kind of whole skin test. My skin probably won't go down now. Um, but, you know, if you pinch your skin on the back of the neck and... Um, you let it go and you haven't got that elasticity. It's one of the kind of the classic signs that a lot of the time when you bring your dog to a vet for dehydration, it's usually because of that. So it's kind of already gone past the initial easy stages to treat. So you're into kind of nearly needing vet treatment at that stage. Um, <clears throat> also, if you look at their gums and you press down on their gums, the, the amount of time that it takes for the gum to return to normal color would be a bit slower. So that's also a classic sign. Um, you know, you've dry, dark gums. So if you're feeling your dog and you feel that their gums are, you know, darker than normal and they're dry, it's also a sign of kind of fairly, you know, moderate dehydration. Um, you know, it, it is also dog dependent. So maybe your dog nearly always has dry gums or your dog's gums are always that bit darker. So it's down to knowing what's normal. So, you know, if your dog is asleep beside you, just kind of have a, a feel around their gums if um if they let you and they don't bite your finger off. Um, you know, and, and everything is down to, do you know, your own dog, your individual dog, and know what's normal for them. If you're finding that your dog is um, weak in the back legs, then it's gone. It's gone kind of to a, a point where your dog is really, really bad and really, really dehydrated. And, you know, you're looking at major vet treatments needed. You know, so if you're finding that you're running and your dog's getting tired and they're panting a lot, I'd say just either stop the run, you know, give them a break, make sure they're hydrated, get them to somewhere where they can kind of have a drink or whatever as well and um, but obviously not too much because too much then is is going to kind of make them sick as well so <clears throat> i managed to get i'm actually very proud of myself i managed to fit that in within the hour um i was talking a little bit quicker than i normally do um so has anybody got any questions um you know like i said i had 70 odd pages of um of slides that i could have I could have waffled on for another hour, um, but I had to kind of cut it short. So it is a, a basic kind of just thrown general bits of information at you. So um, if there's anything that I kind of spoke about that you didn't understand or whatever, 
<clears throat> let me know and um hopefully you did understand with my very thick irish accent um while i was speaking quickly um but yeah if you have any questions on you know either feeding um hydration or you know anything to do with kind of canny sports in general please feel free to ask um but i hope that kind of helped a little bit and like i said you know a lot of the research was done on sled dogs because there's so much you know there's so much at stake with sled dogs you know it's, it's a big sport and um you know the studies were done on them because they're kind of the prime canine athletes and you have to look at you know how they perform and what the best thing for them is um so somebody said if i'm baiting water with food two hours before the run how does that work because they're not supposed to be fed four hours before so yeah i mean when i say putting in a bit of food i mean i'm talking about really really small amount of food like i said you're looking at one sardine for a 20 kilo dog in 200 mils of water so it's not actually food it's just taste it's really only kind of you know it's like you having maybe one of those uh, protein bars or whatever before a run so you're not actually feeding them you're just giving them something and it's more about getting the water into them so you wouldn't be giving them you know like a, a cup full of kibble in the water um within the two hours and that's not what the bait and water is about it's literally just i mean if you need to give them less you know if you find that you know a half a sardine in 200 mils of water is um is enough to make them drink then that's fine as well it, it's more about getting the water into them so um hope that clears that up um somebody said they'd love to hear more i'd love to talk more about it and i could um i could talk all day but um i don't know i think they were talking about maybe extending this um virtual conference so if they do it might be something that i, I can look into as well so um thanks to everyone and it's good to see that uh the, the whole hour change in the uk and ireland didn't um didn't stop people from being here but um yeah if that's everything um i shall sign off but thanks to everyone for giving up an hour on their sunday afternoon and um thank you if you have any questions just pop them in the the comments box below this but um thanks to everyone for joining so enjoy the rest of your day thank you <laughs>